Good morning, and welcome to Myerstown Church of the Brethren this morning. I'm Pastor Dennis. It's good to have you all with us. Just several announcements before we come into our time of worship. Uh, this week we are praying for those listed on page 50 in your church directory, and we are praying for the West Green Tree Church of the Brethren, and the Wyo Missing Church of the Brethren is praying for us. And of course, uh, don't forget those on the prayer list. And Kathy and I have been asked multiple times this morning, any twins yet? And the answer is no, not yet. <laughs> Hopefully this week, yes. Um, just the, the center pews we roped off again this morning just to make it easier for the deacons to uh, serve communion, but uh, we'll probably be removing them again shortly. Um, what, uh, check out some of the items that are in the bulletin. Um, the one informational item that's in there about the um, technical upgrades and um, also wanted to point out that there are a few things showing up back there by the, the ARC that had been donated by Ho Jose Torres. Uh, uh, an anonymous donor is do uh, donating some things to uh, explain that a little bit more. So you might want to take a look at some of those and there'll be another one or two coming. Um, I will not be in the office tomorrow. I have a doctor's appointment in Philadelphia. so. Um, but I will be here Tuesday and staying late on Wednesday. Uh, so I uh, just want to let you know about that. Um, two things about the worship service this morning. You'll notice in your bulletin that we're doing a responsive litany of confession of faith and faith, which comes right after we sing God of grace and God of glory. And all of your, our congregational responses of, of that are going to be sung. They're just a phrase from the hymn that we had just sung. So Earl will be staying up here to help us come in on those at the right time.
to you and peace, my fellow believers. Grace and peace from Jesus who grounds our faith and centers our worship. Grace to you and peace from the one who is and was and is to come. Grace and peace from the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the ruler of all the world. We praise the one who loves us. We give glory to the one who frees us. This is the witness of Christ. This is the good news of Jesus revealed in the scripture and in our living. We are loved. We are all loved and set free. Look, this is our God. Christ is coming that all may see. Look, Christ is here among us. God is creating us into kingdom people so that we may live in God's strength and glory forever. Blessed are you. Blessed are you who hear the good news. God is blessing those who read and keep the word. Blessed is this church, this family of faith, as we meet together. Blessed are we as we pray in power and preach the word. Now let us stand and join in singing, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship, number eight in the blue hymnal. Let us pray. O oh God, you have lighted the stars and kindled our hearts a flame of love for thee. We pray that you make our seeking fruitful, our thinking sound, our singing hearty, and our silence real. Turn us again, O oh Lord, and draw us unto thee with cords of love. 
cleanse our hearts and keep our bodies pure, rule our wills and guide our hands through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now we'll have some music ministry from Barb. Good morning, church. I didn't hear them. Good morning, church. Good morning. <laughs> uh, I welcome you, and I hope I can do the best to honor and praise God. I don't know if I have a cold, allergies, or what, but I will do the best I can. So the first song I'm going to sing, it's called In My Father's House Are Many Mansions. It's taken from the book of John, chapter 14. So, of course, it's not the whole chapter, but certain verses, okay? Or... The second one, I'm sure, probably all know this very well. He's only a prayer away. And I think we all have situations in our life that, yes, you do need a lot of prayer. So I thought this would be an ideal song to sing for this time in our lives, in our country. So, okay, Barb. <laughs>
Thank you, Barb and Barb, for that beautiful music. <clears throat> this morning, our first set of scripture comes from Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 2 and 15 through 21. But now thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you, and through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through, the, through fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. I am the Lord, your Holy One, the Creator of Israel, your King. Thus says the Lord, who makes a way in the sea, a path in the mighty waters, who brings out chariot and horse, army and warrior. They lie down, they cannot rise, they are extinguished, quenched like a wick. Do not remember the former things or consider the things of old. I am about to do a new thing, now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The wild animals will honor me, the jackals and the ostriches, for I give water in the wilderness, rivers in the desert, to give drink to my chosen people, the people whom I formed for myself so that they might declare my praise. Now let us stand and join in singing, God of grace and God of glory, number 366 in the blue hymnal. of litany this morning and your response shall be sung since we just sung the hymnal that matches it. 
God of grace and glory, forgive us when we play it safe and fail to step out in faith. God of grace and glory, forgive us when we, re re we romanticize the past and fear the future. grace and glory, forgive us when we see the speck in another's eye without noticing the log in our own. God of grace and glory, forgive us when we focus too much on ourselves and too little on you. Christ our Lord. Amen. Now let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord, grant us the wisdom to choose the paths in life that lead us to you. Give us courage to stand firm in our faith even when those of us, when those of this world may be against us. May we serve you with steadfast hearts and look forward to our future with you with assurance that no matter what life may hold, you are walking through it with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And the children may come forward for a message from Pastor Dennis. Come on. Good morning, everyone. Hi, Kendallin. How are you this morning? How's everybody doing? Good, good. I missed being with you last week. How many of you like to go swimming? Oh, some of you. How many of you are good swimmers? Oh, okay. Some of you are good, good. I'm going to tell you a little story. My grandson, Will. I remember, yeah, he's, he's going to be 12 next month, so he was probably about, oh, six or seven at the time. And he was out by the pool, and he was, he was scared to jump in the water. And we kept coaxing him and coaxing him, and finally he did it. Finally he jumped in the water. And I thought, well, I jumped in the water in the, in the shallow end. I can run down and jump in the water in the deep end, too. Well, that probably wouldn't have been a good idea, and we stopped him before he did that, because... He needed to learn something first, right? He needed to learn how to swim. Well, he did. He did learn how to swim. And right now, Will and our granddaughters, Isabel and Abigail, live over in a country called the Netherlands over in Europe, about 4,000 miles from here. But they have a lot of water there. And that country has tests that every child needs to pass, a swimming test that every child needs to pass. And there's like three levels that they need to achieve. They were only required to do one, but Will decided to do all three. And this last test that he passed, I'm very proud of him because I probably couldn't do what he did. He had to swim the length of the pool for a half an hour, fully clothed, jacket, pants, shoes, fully clothed. Because in where they live, there's so much water and the, the the reason behind it is if you ever fell in the water, you need to be able to swim, and, and you'll probably be fully clothed if you do that. And he did it. And he, he was so proud of this certificate that he got. Well, sometimes he, he was prepared now for, what, for a time when he might fall in the water. I want to share one verse with you from the, the scripture that Kim read. Do not fear, for I am with you. You know, sometimes we we get uh, situations where we need to get through the water too, where we get to through, have to go through difficulties in our lives. Things are hard, challenges that come our way. Uh, maybe it's something at school or, or something, uh, you know, you're, you're trying out for a sport team and you want to get on it and, and that challenges is pretty, pretty strong, pretty hard. 
But uh, whatever the challenges are that come our way, God says, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. I am with you. And I think when I think of Will swimming that pool back and forth for a half an hour fully clothed, that was pretty hard to do. And I'm sure somewhere along the line he thought, am I going to make it? Am I going to make it? But he did. And God was with him the whole way. And God's with us and God's with you when things get hard. Let's say a prayer this morning, okay? God, thank you for these children. And we just pray that when challenges come their way, when something seems hard, something seems difficult, remind them that no matter what the challenge is, you are with them. Bless them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for coming up. Our second set of scripture this morning comes from Revelations chapter 21, verses 1 through 5. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, See, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. Death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more, for the first things have passed away. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this, for these words are trustworthy and true. Well, last week I attended the 234th recorded annual conference of the Church of the Brethren as your delegate. And I use that word attended loosely as this year's conference was held virtually, so I attended by sitting at home in front of my computer. Now, despite being unable to be present with other brethren in person, it was a good, a good conference. The main item of business was the approval of a compelling vision for the denomination, which has been about four years now in the making. And I'll be sharing more about that in the church newsletter and, and with the board and commissions. And the theme of this year's conference was God's Adventurous Future. Moderator Paul Mundy wrote this about that theme. He says, our future is not uneventful. It is marked by rigorous peaks, rushing currents, and deep valleys. Thus, there is challenge in the journey that, in all honesty, can be unsettling, even anxiety-producing. Such angst marks, in particular, our pilgrimage as the church. Numerous issues not only rumble among us, they tear at us, threatening the very fabric of the church's well-being. As we acknowledge such reality, it's hard to be optimistic, but it's wise to be expectant, even hopeful, for God moves among us, calling us beyond our bewilderment and discord. Scripture bears witness to God's audacious initiative. I'm about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth. Do you not perceive it? I will make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. It's God's dependability and accuracy that charts our course. Yes, much rattles and disrupts. We have our doubts and are afraid. Yet we press on toward God's adventurous future, drawing on the endurance of God. Moderator Mundy's words, we have our doubts and are afraid, remind me of some comments I've heard here at Myerstown Church of the Brethren over the past year or so. It seems that because of the events of several years ago, which, which rattled and disrupted the life of this congregation, such as the departure of two pastors and, and also many members, there are some doubts and some fears concerning moving ahead, especially with the pastoral search. I've periodically reminded the board, the Ministry and Evangelism Commission, and the deacons that I am your interim pastor. And really, one of my jobs as your interim pastor is to work myself out of a job. Now, I was fully aware coming into this position that it was probably going to be a longer-term interim. And despite all the challenges that COVID threw at us, I think God has blessed our time together as pastor and congregation. 
But I think now it's time. Time for you to look ahead to the adventurous future God has in store for you as a congregation. Each morning business session at annual conference opened with a Bible study led by seminary professor and author Michael J. Gorman on portions of the book of Revelation. Now, brethren have often shied away from this book of the Bible, feeling that, well, how we live for Jesus in the present is more important than speculating about this often hard-to-understand book. But this year, conference focused around these words given by Jesus to John of Patmos. And as the book of Revelation opens, we find seven messages from Jesus to the angels of the seven churches in Asia, which is modern-day Turkey. And each of the seven messages follows a similar pattern. Jesus is identified as the revealer. There is an I know your situation kind of statement followed by commendations or chastisements, then any corrective actions that might be required, a promise to those who are faithful, and one statement that appears in some version of all the messages, let anyone who has an ear to listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. These messages are are kind of like a report card for those seven churches. And just like every child is unique has unique learning styles and unique personality and unique needs and goals. So every local church has unique needs, goals, and has a unique personality and a calling. Each of the seven cities to which those churches were located was unique. Ephesus and Smyrna were seaports, and Ephesus was the larger of the two and was the commercial center of the Roman province of Asia. Pergamum was a center of Roman imperial cult and of emperor worship. Thyatira was what we might call a blue-collar city with many trade guilds. Philadelphia was a small town on the eastern fringes of the empire and served as an outpost to keep enemies out of Roman territory. And Laodicea was a, a wealthy city known for banking for the manufacture of wool, and for a medical school which produced a famous eye ointment. It was also well known that this city had an inadequate water supply, which required aqueducts to bring water into the city. Well, each of the churches in those seven cities was also unique in the commendations or chastisements Jesus directed to them. Some were commended for their hard work and service, for their endurance and their loyalty through persecution, and for their love and faithfulness. Likewise, each was chastised for reasons such as losing their first love, or for their tolerance of idolatry and immorality, for their superficial faith. And as with Laodicea, like the water that came to the city in the aqueducts that fed its water supply, for its lukewarm faith. Having spent 30 years in education, I know that students and parents sometimes wonder, does the teacher really care about me or my child? Well, have you ever wondered, does God really care about this church, about these people, and what happens here? I think these seven letters to those churches answer that question. Yes, God cares and Jesus cares. Jesus is paying attention to his church back then and today. I know your works, he said. I know your affliction. I know where you're living. I know the things that you do. Likewise, Jesus knows what's happening here at Myerstown Church of the Brethren and what's not happening. He knows our works, our faithfulness, the positive things we do, and he knows our shortcomings. And if Jesus has a message to the church at Myerstown, I don't doubt that it would include the phrase, but I have this against you, as it would to any other church. If Jesus was here at Myerstown this morning and having a conference of sorts with us, what might he say? As with any good teacher, he would probably start with the things for which he can commend us, like our service in the community, our endurance even through some difficult days, and our love for one another. 
Maybe he would talk about the sharing cupboard, our outreach ministries, our sense of volunteerism. But then maybe he would move on to those areas where we need to improve. Maybe he would talk about things like a, a superficial or lukewarm faith or, or a lack of unity within the body. He might bring up a sense of timidity or lack of trust to move forward in a pastoral search. Then he might say something like, this is what you need to do. And he would maybe include things like, remember, repent, don't be afraid, hold fast to what you have. Then he might pause for a moment and look at us with caring and loving eyes and say something like this. You know, those shortcomings, those, those places where you've failed to live as my faithful disciples, all of those things I said you need to improve upon come down to one thing and one thing only. Stay close to me. Keep your eyes on me. Seek to be like me. Take me seriously. And all those other things will take care of themselves. Well, what I want to say this morning, brothers and sisters, is that it, it's time. Really, I'm not trying to work myself out of a job. Kathy and I like it here. But I think it's time. Time to move on into that adventurous future that God has in store for this congregation. Yes, it's time for maybe some serious self-examination as individuals and as a church. Time to confess our timidity and seek God's forgiveness. Time to pray for God's wisdom and guidance. Time to more truly and sincerely love one another. Time for each one of us to take our own walk as a, a disciple of Jesus more seriously. Time to be the church, not the institution, but the people that God wants us to be. Time to remember who we are and what it is that we are part of. In his book, The Most Revealing Book of the Bible, Making Sense of Revelation, at the conclusion of his chapter on the seven letters to the seven churches, Brethren author Bernard Eller suggests what John really wants his readers to understand is this, that whether you recognize it or not, your history is part of the great and universal mission being directed from God's throne. What you do and what happens to you is an integral and meaningful part of the wonderful thing God is doing with the cosmos through Christ to evil and for mankind. And until you can understand what it is you're part of, you're bound to see yourself and your efforts as lowly. You're defeated before you even get into the game. But look at it once from the perspective of God's throne, and you'll see that because of Jesus, there's no way we can lose. Isaiah 43, 19 promises that God is about to do a new thing. Now it springs forth, he says, do you not perceive it? I'll make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. The setting there in Isaiah is that the children of Israel are in captivity in Babylon, but anticipating a return home. And imagine, I imagine that some of the questions they might be asking would be like this. How, how are we going to get home? What literal water, rivers, and fire and flames might we have to pass through as God gathers us, gathers us together once again? God promises in Isaiah 43, 2, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. 49 years ago, Hurricane Agnes struck Pennsylvania one week before Kathy and I were to get married in Levittown, Pennsylvania. All the invitations were sent, the RSVPs received, the ceremony scheduled, the musicians arranged, and a reception hall reserved. Everything was set. But because of Agnes, the big question was, would anybody be able to get there? Me and my family in particular. Southeastern Pennsylvania, where Kathy lived, wasn't hit too hard. But central PA was pretty well isolated because of all the flooding. There were some obstacles in the way of our carefully laid plans. And most of us don't like when obstacles stand in the way of our best laid plans. Some people, however, like Nick Walenda, 
the seventh generation of that famous Walenda acrobatic family, seemed to thrive on facing challenges and obstacles. In June of 2012, you might recall, he walked across Niagara Falls, a length of about four and a half football fields on a two inch cable stretched about 200 feet above the falls. He said this walk was one of the most difficult he'd ever done because if he looked down, he saw the raging waters of the falls. And when he looked ahead, there was a heavy mist making visibility difficult and causing the cable to get very wet. Sometimes in life, sometimes in the life of the church, we might feel like we're walking a tightrope. But unlike Walenda, we don't get to cross above the water. We have to pass through it. And notice in Isaiah there, God doesn't say, if you pass through the waters. He says, when you pass through the waters. Each of us individually as a church are going to have to pass through some raging waters. It's guaranteed. Sometimes they might be literal or physical obstacles. Sometimes those obstacles might be imagined. And when facing obstacles, it's important to remember the second part of Isaiah 43, 2, where God says, I will be with you. With the presence and the power of God, we can face any obstacles. Reading those seven messages to the seven churches in chapters two and three of the book of Revelation, I realized Jesus was pointing out some obstacles being faced by each of those churches and what each one needed to do to overcome them. Jesus tells them that what they need to do to overcome these obstacles is things such as to patiently endure, to not be afraid, to repent, to hold tightly to what you have. He says that twice. And to persevere. A little after 10 p.m. on June 15, 2012, Nick Walenda left the American side of Niagara Falls and took a, started out on his half-hour walk to the Canadian side. The mist was so heavy, he could, not be, he could not see the other side. So he moved slowly across the 1,800 feet of cable, which in the darkness and fog made him appear to float above the raging waters below. And as he moved along the swaying and slippery cable, he offered prayers of praises and thanks to Jesus. Well, Linda says that he crossed the falls, he felt a sense of peace. But because of the rushing falls and the fog, he struggled to stay focused on the cable. That's the way it often is when we're facing obstacles. Everything seems to be swirling around us. Decisions to make, other people offering us their advice, often more questions than answers. What should we do? Where should we go? Sometimes it becomes overwhelming. And in the mist, it's difficult to discern how we're going to get through. As a congregation, you're faced with a major task as you begin a search for a new pastor. And because of past experience, you may be feeling apprehensive. You may be afraid. But God's word promises us an adventurous future when we can put aside our fears and trust God to help us overcome those obstacles. So how can you overcome? Well, first of all, let me suggest stay focused. Stay focused. Despite the distractions of raging water and mist, Nick Walenda needed to keep his eye on his footing if he was going to make it to the other side. When the waters are raging around us, fear can cause us to lose our focus. Fear of the unknown. Fear of what special circumstances might mean. Fear and worry that creeps in as your mind raises all those what-if questions. Even when there's chaos all around, remember the, what God says in his word. In that 27th Psalm, he says, the Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. In Isaiah 41, he says, do not fear for I am with you. Do not be afraid for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. If you lose your footing, if you lose your focus, if you lose your connection to Christ, you may fall. Stay focused on Christ. 
Second of all, realize what you have in Christ. The ABC television network invested $1.3 million in that Niagara Falls event and, and obviously wanted it to be successful. They didn't want to see Willenda falling into the falls below. So because of the extreme danger of the Niagara Falls crossing, even though he didn't want to do it, ABC required Willenda to wear a safety harness. And as he approached the halfway point, the wind and the water were taking their toll. Over the microphone that he was wearing, he was heard to say, I'm strained, I'm drained. This is so physical, not only mental, but physical. My hands are going numb. I feel like I'm getting weak. There was no guarantee he was going to make it across, but the safety harness would have averted disaster if he had slipped. Christ is our safety line. Twice in the seven letters, Jesus in the seven letters in Revelation, Jesus challenges the churches to hold on to what you have. When the obstacles seem overwhelming, remember how you've been blessed in Christ. Remember God's forgiveness. Remember the Holy Spirit's power. Remember God's mercy and grace. Remember God's promise to be with you. Jesus is our safety line. His promise is to be with us always. Realize all that you have and how you have been blessed in Christ. And third, know that even in the face of obstacles, you do not walk alone. Nick Willenda neared the end of his walk as he ended, as he ended, as he neared the end of his walk, he heard the cheers from the crowd, knelt down on the cable, pumped his fist, and then ran those final few steps to the end where he was embraced by his family. We know God has promised to be with us. His spirit is in us and with us through Christ. And we are a family, a faith family. And through Christ, God is creating this community, this faith family in which we are brothers and sisters, helping each other to keep our focus, helping each other to remember what we have in Christ. Running from obstacles or refusing to face them might seem easier than dealing with them. But in the end, such actions and attitudes are self-destructive. If you don't face the obstacles, nothing changes. If you don't like where you are, you need to do something to make a change. And that most likely means going through water and fire. If you don't walk through the waters, through the flames, or try to scale the walls, you don't know and you, won't, you don't grow and you won't know the ex or experience the power you've been given in Christ to face the challenges. The message is to the churches that open the book of Revelation. Let us know that as a congregation, we are not that much different from those seven churches. As they had some issues to deal with, so do we. As they had fears, so do we. But the end of Revelation, beginning in chapter 21, reveals the fulfillment of God's promise to do a new thing, to make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Revelation 21 reveals that new thing God will do. God promises an adventurous future in a new heaven and a new earth where the obstacles we come up against now are gone. And because of that promised future, we can put aside our apprehensions and our fears because God has an amazing future in store for us. Not just that future when Jesus comes, but an amazing future tomorrow and the next day, we put our faith and trust in Christ. And that includes any fears and trepidations you might have about a pastoral search. Trust God to lead this congregation into the adventurous future God has planned for you. And when you pass through the waters, he says, I will be with you. They will not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned and the flame will not consume you. For I am the Lord, your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. And the one who was seated on the throne said, See, I am making all things new. And also he said this, These words are trustworthy and true. Trust that God is leading this church into an adventurous future. We often think of communion as a time for remembrance. For Christ did tell us to remember him and what he has done for us as we share the bread and the cup. 
So this morning I invite you to be powerfully aware of Christ's presence with us through the bread and the cup. And in the midst of our trepidations and fears, Christ is here. He is with us. The deacons can prepare to, to take the communion to him. On the night of his arrest, Jesus took bread, gave thanks to God, broke it, and said, This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. The deacons will pass the bread and ask you to hold the bread until all have been served. you pray with me? Loving and ever-present God, as we eat this bread, we are aware of that part inside ourselves that is fearful, hurting, or broken. We give our fears and hurts to you and invite your presence into our brokenness. It is there you can reach us, care for us, and lead us into your adventurous future. Amen. Let us share together the affirmation for the bread. The bread which we break is the communion of the body of Christ. Take and eat. The one who promised to make all things new announced to his first disciples, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink from it, all of you. The deacons will distribute the cup.
Would you pray with me? As we remember the new covenant you established through Christ, O oh God, may we be renewed in mind, body, and spirit in order to live out the promise and in the power you give to all your disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. And let us share the words of affirmation for the cup. The cup which we bless is the communion of the blood of Christ. Take and drink. Would you pray with me? We give thanks, O God, for this holy meal that you have given us. May the power and presence of Christ, so evident in this ordinance, be evidenced in our thoughts, words, and deeds. Keep us mindful of the example of Christ. Filled with the power of the Holy Spirit, we seek to follow him into your adventurous future. Amen. Let us stand and sing together our closing hymn, New Earth, Heaven's New, 299 in the Blue Hymnals. Go now, new creatures, into the adventurous future that God has in store for each of you 
and for this church and go in Christ's peace. Amen. Don't